Good afternoon. I think everybody's starting to uh, make the way in. Just need to start meeting people. Good, good, good. Mike, are you um, are you ready to get started? I'm ready when you are, Hamza. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Do we have how many do we have uh, any in the lobby waiting? Just you can't see anybody in the lobby waiting, can you? No, I can't see. No, uh, no I can see people in here, but I can't see anyone waiting. OK, fine. We'll just get started. Obviously, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those that are not yet on here, this has been recorded. Um, and uh, welcome to the new tax year changes and opportunities that we've brought to you with Humphrey and Co. Uh, this will be presented by myself, Hamza Shalchi. Some of you on the call will probably know me. And Michael Bryan, who has grown a lovely moustache since this photo <laughs> was taken. That, Mike... that photo is about 10 years old, I think, Hamza. I've also put a little bit of weight on as well, frustratingly. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years plus the VAT. Um, Michael Bryan is a partner and chartered accountant at Humphrey & Co. Um, Mike and I have worked together for, yeah, probably about 10 years ago when he looked like that. Um, <laughs> and uh, Mike is a genius and a wizard with all things UK taxes, whether that's repatriating expats, whether that's business owners or... Um, anybody basically. Uh, I know that you deal a lot with with dentists, Mike, and you've referred quite a few clients over to me. And the relationship is so strong that I even refer quite a few people over to Mike. Um, so welcome, Mike. Um, we'll get this uh, this webinar underway. Uh, he says. So the agenda for today's meeting is uh, the changes from last year, 2023 to 2024, for 24-25. Uh, we're going to go through a few client cases and then we'll be finishing off with a Q&A. So during the course of this webinar, if anybody does have any questions or queries, please leave them in the, uh, the Q&A section or in the chat. If we can answer them during the course of this webinar, we will. And if we can't then, uh, or if we don't get back to everybody during the webinar, we will come back to you individually on any of the questions or queries that you might have. So to kick us off, Mike, do you want to go through the spring budget and give us some key announcements from Jeremy Hunt? Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Hamza. Um, so spring budget uh, was about a month ago. Uh, wasn't overly exciting. Um, I think with the knowledge that there will be a general election before Jan 25, they're probably keeping some things in their pockets um, to try and persuade voters to stick with them later in the year. Um, Main announcements on screen, uh, I'll just whiz through them all and elaborate on them when needed. Uh, draft legislation has been prepared to extend full expensing leased asset to leased assets. Uh, long story short with that one, if you're buying or leasing a lot of equipment in your business, then then you're going to continue to get tax relief on it. Uh, for big, big businesses, it used to be big, uh, not, uh, some thresholds that uh, meant you had to spread some um, capital allowances over multiple years. Um, VAT registration threshold increases to 90k. I was, I was looking up on this um, earlier and the the VAT threshold in 1415, so about 10 years ago, was, was 81k. Um, and then it sat at 85k for the previous five years and the government um, froze it there in this thing called fiscal, fiscal drag, which they're um, also doing with not raising personal allowances for income tax just means that more businesses naturally are going into the VAT threshold because their income's going up with inflation um, and the, the thresholds aren't keeping up with inflation. It, it would be nice to see the government come back in and say that they're going to inflation link things like the VAT threshold and the personal allowances and various other things that we'll touch on. 
New ISA, the British ISA, yeah, great for investing in British businesses. Um, ho hopefully we'll do what it says on, it, on the tin. Uh, it's not out yet. I think it's coming in a year from now. Very mm -hmm. much more Hamza's uh, area of expertise that, than mine, but it, but it is there and, and watch this space. Biggest one, in my opinion, was the furnished, well, one of the biggest ones was the furnished holiday lettings regime uh, to be abolished. That um, historically has been really nice if anyone's got property that they rent in like Airbnb or uh, as, as a furnished holiday let, um, where they can claim uh, a few things. So, so more capital allowances because a furnished holiday let is expected to provide, you know, a furnished um, complete property that someone can go and holiday in. But also, more importantly, um, you've got full tax relief on your interest, which those with residential buy-to-let properties will know there's a restriction now. Um, you could get what's known as entrepreneurs relief or business asset disposal relief on the sale of furnished holiday lets. That will also go. And um, furnished holiday lets used to be relevant earnings for, for pension contributions. So anyone looking to invest heavily into their pension um, may not be able to put as much money in depending on what their other income is going in the year. Now, now that fortuitously is coming in next year. So uh, April 25, which allows some planning. Um, th th there's not going to be a, anything else that's really coming in to replace it. It's just going. So anyone with furnished holiday lets needs to just be aware um, of the changes and the impact that will have for them. Be aware of this them. Slide. Oh, go on, Hamza. Be aware and sell them or just be aware to plan for the future. I mean, I had a client asking me about this yesterday. Yeah. Good, great question. I think it's individual. I think if the investment's still a good investment, then I wouldn't necessarily jump ship to sell them because of uh, the new changes. Mm. It very much depends on uh, the debt position of this person. So, and And I suppose the actual person and how they use their holiday let because if it is a genuine investment and they never go on holiday there um yeah actually it might be a decision to sell it and then to invest somewhere else mm. if however you know it's the kids families uh sorry it's the families with children's uh bolt told to go on their summer holidays as, as well as generating some income you know that might not be sufficient to say um sell up and and go and do something else mm, thanks no worries. But yeah, definitely do the numbers as with all of these things. We, we It's nice to know what's going to happen in the future. Um, and therefore, actually, you can do the numbers and, and make some decisions yourself. Of course, there's the uncertainty of the general election and what Labour, if Labour get in, what Labour will do with, with the tax uh, tax rates and changes and things like that, which is just an unknown. Um, Stamp duty, land tax, multiple dwellings relief to be abolished. The easiest way to explain this is if I was buying a property for a million quid, but actually let's say it was one big freehold with four different flats in, you would pay stamp duty on a million quid's worth of property, which because stamp duty goes up, the percentage goes up, the higher, the, the more expensive the property, you would pay a lot of stamp duty if you bought a million pound asset. If there are multiple dwellings in that one uh, property, then then you essentially you pay stamp duty on four times 250 grand. In this example, four flats, 250 grand each, you'll pay a lot less stamp duty. That's going to go. It was brought in to inspire uh, people to invest in uh, invest in, invest in properties. And the government are obviously taking the assumption that that this relief is no longer. Um, I wouldn't say attractive. It's definitely attractive. It's no longer something that that, that they want to offer. Um, and will bring, you know, property developers mainly in, in more into the scope of, stat, of tax, higher stamp duty when they buy uh, properties that they may want to develop. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, higher rate of capital gains tax. So this was a surprise, certainly a surprise to me. I, I didn't see this coming. Um, quite nice again it's for people with additional properties that they rent out historically you've paid um 28 as a higher rate taxpayer so if you're paying higher rates of tax if you earn over 50k uh, from other income then you'll be a higher rate taxpayer you'd pay 28 percent on any uh, gain on a rental property that's going to 24 percent 
Mm. Is there any reduction on the uh, law rate taxpayer, so the, the standard 20% taxpayer? Interestingly, no, it's staying at 18% for them. Right, okay, great, thank you. Um, and CGT residential properties just have an automatic hire. So CGT used to be 18, 28%. It then went to 10 and 20% with the exception of residential property that stayed at 18 to 28 percent and that was 2016 um where they attacked landlords they they bought in the mortgage interest restriction section section 24 they bought in uh they didn't reduce the capital gains tax as they did for all other assets and what was the other one they bought in escapes me but uh, there was something else they bought they bought in as well um to oh it was the increased uh, stamp duty on second properties the increased three percent stamp duty on second properties so um what they're trying to do is re reduce the burden for landlords um that don't want to sell their properties because of the, the tax impact um may just mean that more landlords do cash in mm. um don't know if we're touching on it later but again going back to the potential new government um, and potential changes to tax rates Labour are pretty vocal that um, capital gains tax may be aligned to income tax. So at the moment it's 10 or 20 percent for assets other than residential property um, and is 18 or 24 percent for residential property. That could, it's massive could, no one knows, but it could go to 20 or 40 percent. Um, if Labour gets into power, Labour see it as a wealth tax. Wealthy people pay capital gains tax, non-wealthy people don't pay capital gains tax, and, and therefore that kind of goes hand in hand with their manifesto in, um, in, in helping workers. Wow, very interesting. That's come in, that came in last week, last Friday, so that was that was almost automatically in, I'm, I'm pretty sure, so, so from 24-25 we'll, we'll be in. I won't Hans, is it fair to say most people watching this will be UK residents? Do we think? Uh, there could be a mix. So if you could just briefly touch on the non-DOM uh, yeah. tax status. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, like the British ISA, it's a bit work in progress. So the finer details aren't announced yet. So watch the space. It's not in yet. It's coming in in um, April 25. Um, what will happen? So at the moment, and uh, let's just go to the rules now. The rules now, um, when someone comes to the UK, you look at the statutory residency test, which basically looks at your ties and the amount of days you're in the UK to work out if you're a, a, a subject to UK tax. Um, and what non-DOMs have always had, this kind of privilege of being a non-DOM, which basically means you're, you're, you're not British. Um, you, you consider yourself born in a different country. You know, you may hold an Italian passport or, or any other jurisdiction. Um, it, it says that if you're um, in the UK and you've got worldwide income, so non-UK income, then unless you remit that income to the UK, you may not need to pay tax on it. It's a really complex um, legislation. Let me try and explain it slightly different. We use the example of um, our lovely prime minister's wife and the uproar that happened when people realised she was using this completely legitimately. There's absolutely nothing wrong with what she was doing. Well, I mean, I haven't inquired into her affairs, but from, from what we know, there's <laughs> nothing wrong in what she was doing. <laughs> Uh, in that she is non-DOM. She was, she uh, I think is Indian um, in uh, birth and, and passport holding and, and class herself as Indian. Um, and therefore is taxed on her UK income and also taxed on any income she remits from India. Now her dad is a very wealthy Indian businessman um, and she um, um, fortuitously for her has inherited, I think a lot, a lot of that wealth. So if she doesn't bring that money into the UK, she doesn't pay any tax on it. And in compensation for that, HMRC won't allow her a personal allowance. So most people in the UK can earn £12,500 uh, without paying tax. If you claim the remittance basis, you don't get that. Also, if you earn over 100 k that, that gets abated as well separately. Um, but also what you've got is this thing called the remittance basis charge, which generally for non-wealthy people, uh, non-DOMs, it means that, that, that you don't go down this route once you live in the UK for, for seven of the previous nine years, because if you do, 
you will pay £30,000 a year to HMRC um, to continue to continue using this um, this relief. And that goes to £60,000. Uh, I think it's 12 of the previous 15 years. Long story short, the, someone like Risi Sunak's wife um, paying 30 grand a year or 60 grand a year to HMRC is preferable to being taxed on worldwide income. So that's what happened. What is now going to happen is that going to be abolished. There's going to be a new um, uh, relief come in, which sounds like it's going to be simpler. It broadly says if you've been outside the UK for 10 years, um, when you come to the UK, you can have four years in the UK where you don't pay tax on your worldwide income. You can remit that income to the UK. There's no problem with that. So it's not now about if you move money to the UK or not, you're allowed to. After four years, you pay tax on your worldwide income. It it's still one of the most generous. It's, it's perceived to be one of the most generous um, uh, taxation legislation in the main um, European economy. So um, still should uh, not penalise the the high earners coming into the UK to to work in the UK and therefore pay tax in the UK. Okay. High income child benefit charge. Um, Again, I was looking at this earlier and let me see where my notes are. Yeah, um, because I wondered when it came in and it came in in Jan 2013. And from Jan 2013, it looks at, um, uh, well, let's go back to basis, uh, the high income uh, child benefit charge. If you claim child benefit, you can get it's about 25 quid for the first child and then about another 10 pounds ish for every child thereafter uh, a week from HMRC. Um, if and it looks at how household income, this is they're bringing this into line. That's uh, I think what the slide says in um, April 26, they're going to be assessed on a household basis rather than an individual basis. But at the moment, it's still individual. So if the higher earner of the household earned over £60,000, then um, if the household claimed child benefit, that they that would be repaid when the higher earner completes their tax return. Um, which was a burden for those that were employees because they don't have to do tax returns unless they earn over 100k. But if they had child benefit, if the spouse was claiming it, then they would need to do a tax return. If their income was over 50k and under 60k, they would repay a proportion of it. And that's been around since Jan 2013. And um, quite nicely, um, the government have uh, realised that inflation's been pretty high. I think it's been pretty mean that they haven't linked this to inflation for the last 10, 11 years, but they are going to increase those bans. So um, the minimum threshold will be £60,000, which means if the higher income of the household earns under £60,000, they keep all of the child benefit and the uh, upper end is now going to be £80,000. So if the higher earner earns under 80, they will keep a proportion of that benefit. The other childcare um, that is available for um, UK residents is the tax-free childcare, which is an NSNI bank account you can set up. Uh, and for every 80 quid you put in, the government will come and put in an extra 20 quid. Um, so long as you spend that on approved childcare, so registered childcare. And the 30 hours free childcare, which is now just being extended to one and two year olds, I think at the end of this year. Certainly um, has. Yeah, Hamza, you'll know all about that. Yep. Um, if the higher earner of the household earns over 100K, then you don't get your right to that. And that's cliff edge. And no one in the tax world likes cliff edge things. Anyone that's old enough to remember when stamp duty used to be cliff edge, you used to get, I'll get the right rates wrong, but say you wanted to sell, sell your house for 260K, the threshold was 250K. And therefore, if you sell it for 10K more, the buyer's going to pay a ridiculous amount more stamp duty because it's over the threshold because it was cliff edge. Um, and I think back in the day, people used to sell their house for 250K and then sell the carpets and the fittings and light fit fixtures and all those things for the extra 10 grand to, to kind of sidestep that, uh, rightly or wrongly. Um, Childcare benefits for the 100K is cliff edge again still. So if you expect to earn over 100K, then you lose the right to those uh, childcare benefits. Both of these are on adjusted income. So uh, high, high, high 
income child benefit charge and the, the other child care I've been talking about. So if you were at 110K of income and you put a gross in uh, pension contribution of 10K into your pension, you now your adjusted income is back down to 100K and you can claim those childcare benefits, not the high income child benefit charge, because that was 80K, um, but, but the other ones we were talking about here. Speaking to a, a, a client of mine, I think if you use all of these allowances, it's worth like 10 grand a child, um, something like that. Uh, Richards asked, is child benefit charge on adjusted income too? Uh, yes, it is adjusted income. Is it only one? Sorry, we've got some questions. Is it only one earner or the household income? At the moment, it's on the higher income, higher earner of the household. So whoever's the higher earner would need to then consider whether they need to declare or um, stop claiming any of these child benefits. Adjusted income is broadly taxable income, less uh, charitable donations and pension contributions. Um, and what about the childcare? Is that household or earner? Don't know the question there. Um, if you want to rephrase that, come. He's going to rephrase it, I think. Um, we can see him typing. Uh, so at the, at the moment, just to confirm, because I think I might have gathered what he's asking about, the high income child benefit charges on the um, higher earner at the moment, but from April 26 will be on household. So I imagine they're going to go, if household income is 120K or less, you keep it all. If it's 160K or more, you keep none of it. And if it's between the two, you repay a portion. That's going to be um, a difficulty for us accountants um, because we're going to need to know what spouse earns as well as our client, which sometimes we don't know. Also, HMRC are going to need to gear up their systems to make sure they know who is the partner of someone else, which obviously in uh, most relationships is obvious, but in some relationships that can be a little bit um, practitious. Uh, is the 100k threshold for childcare or for household or for one earner? So the 100k threshold is for uh, the higher earner of the household. So if the higher earner earns over 100k, you can't claim tax-free childcare or the 30 hours free childcare. I think you still get the 15 hours free childcare, um, but the 30 hours you don't get. I don't know what's happening to one and two year olds because they haven't announced that yet, even though it's coming in September. Um, so watch this space for that one. Uh, someone else has asked, when does the threshold increase from 50k to 60k? I looked at this and I'm pretty sure it's 24, 25, i.e. 6th of April this year. Um, I can probably find out live, which I probably shouldn't do on a webinar, but there we go. Um, Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, it is from 24, 25 as well. I think I um, I did some research with a client the other day who made a last minute 270 pound contribution to his uh, to his pension for that reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's not coming up on here as quickly as that. I'll, I'll come back to that one when I've got a bit of time after the webinar just to double 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 check. But I'm uh, yeah pretty confident as Hamza is um, that you uh, that that's coming now. Okay. Um, um, National insurance. National insurance contributions. Uh, yeah, both been cut. So class one is the um, rate that employees pay. That's gone from 10 to 8 percent. And class four is the rate that self-employment people pay, which has gone from 8 to 6 percent. Broadly, we'll save uh, someone earning 50K a year, about 750 quid, quid, quid a year in reduced national insurance contributions. Anyone that's an employer, has to pay employers national insurance. It's 13.8 percent. It hasn't changed, um, but they do get an employer's allowance of the first five grand off their employer's national insurance contribution. Richard, just to answer your question, so you can claim childcare if you both earn 99K. Yeah, you can at the moment. Uh, if you both earn 99K, if husband and wife earn 99K, you can both, uh, you can claim the uh, childcare. If uh, one, so let's say uh, one of the spouses was earning 10 grand and the other was earning 101 grand, you can't claim the childcare benefits. 
and it's massively unfair of course in that scenario what we would look to do is make a pension contribution for the person that's just creeping over the, the 100k mark to to allow them to claim these childcare benefits to summarize um professionals employees nothing too exciting it all kind of happens automatically for you reduced national insurance so from this month everyone should see um, every worker should see an increase in their pay um, because of a decrease in national insurance high income child benefit child thresholds if you're teetering around 60 80k and you don't know uh, exactly what it's going to be maybe you're on 60k with a discretionary bonus the um the the advice is to claim it because you can't backdate these claims you can backdate for like three months so if you're not sure what your income is going to be claim it worst case scenario is you repay it when you do your tax still good for cash flow yeah you get every four weeks you'll get x amount of money from the government depending on how many children you have and then you'll repay it if you're over the threshold to hmrc a year later 18 months later when you come to file and pay your taxes for the year so um, if you're not sure do do claim it so um, just to go back on that you what, what you did say earlier about uh obviously most people do a self-assessment over 100k yeah are people who are claiming child benefit earning between 60 and 80k are you saying they should be doing a, a tax return now yes exactly that so the triggers for there's multiple triggers to of when you have to do a tax return one is just simply if you earn over 100k it's one of the thresholds one of the um uh, regulations you have to do a tax return it gets very sensitive in that area so that's why they make you do it two if you or your partner and partner is normally defined with who you're living with um is claiming child benefit and your income is over 60k then um you need to file a tax return and we've had it with um some clients that have come to us where they didn't realize that their spouse was claiming child benefit and they had been earning over um, 50, the old 50 to 60K, and they've had to repay a few grand's worth of tax, or well, high, high income child benefit tax charges to HMRC, along with interest, along with potentially penalties. So um, highlight, maybe speak to, speak to the spouse and see if they're claiming anything that you're not aware of and, and see if you should be reporting it. Interesting. Nice conversation for us to have this evening. Yes. Any change for business owners? Yeah, loads. Um, so company, so broadly companies have been at attacked in inverted commas in the recent years. Um, nothing new per se in the budget, but corporation tax went up April 23. Uh, dividend, the tax on dividends went up. Uh, over COVID time by the increase 1.25%, which was this kind of COVID national insurance thing, which then came back down for employees, but never came back down for dividends. So you combine those two things, actually, um, for simple companies, you may be better as a sole trader again. Again, it depends on your circumstances. There is still vast ways you can save tax as a company, but you need to be uh, aware of the rules and aware of where you're going to get some savings um, so speak to your accountant about it company cash reserves um, successful companies generally will be sitting on cash because the director doesn't want to uh, shareholder director doesn't want to take it out for personal use in order to avoid higher rate dividend tax so it wouldn't be surprising if they're sitting on some cash um, Hamza, I think you've spoken to a few of my clients recently on, on some clever things that that company can, can now be doing with that cash. Yeah, essentially, a lot of business owners quite often hold on to cash. Company bank accounts and corporate bank accounts don't offer very good interest rates at the moment. So um, quite often companies want to keep money in, in, the, uh, in their accounts for potential uh, expansions or um, big purchases that they might, may have coming up. We've set up corporate um, general investment accounts, so the business can actually hold the cash on a platform, and from cash you can earn in excess of five percent, or they could invest it into the markets. And you know, some clients over the last twelve months have done very, very well um, in 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 the markets over the last twelve months. You know, achieving ten, twelve percent returns. And you know, I know that NatWest, which is a, one of the the company bank accounts that we have, offer us nothing 
uh, for holding cash in the account. So um, that's definitely something we can talk to business owners about. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and I think you have done so for some of my clients as well. So thank you for, for that. No problem. Um, investors, we touched on the furnished holiday let. So if you've got one, think about it. Uh, think about potentially selling, uh, but the impact of capital gains tax. And then just some easy wins that a lot of people, so this can be employees, business owners, investors, um, a lot of people miss out on. Um, so the getting tax relief on your pension contributions, full tax relief on your pension contributions. It's always been something that the government have potentially toyed with removing or, remo or not making it as generous. At the moment it is, if you put money into your pension, you will save tax on putting money into that pension. The annual allowance has just gone up to 60K, um, which means that you can put 60K into a pension a year um, and get tax relief on it. And there's a lot of people that, you know, I come across and speak to that, that are cash rich, um, aren't utilising their pensions and therefore perceivably paying too much tax over their life because they're not using these reliefs available to them. EIS, VCTs, SEIS investments. Again, if you um, fancy investing in some young companies, EIS, you'll get 30% uh, back. So if you put 100 quid into an EIS, HMRC will come and put you, give you 30 quid back, um, which is quite nice. And there's some tax exemptions on them as well. If you hold the shares for three years, they're capital gains tax free. Uh, VCTs uh, similarly come with some added tax benefits. Generally, you look at those, you know, um, after you look at pensions because they're more risky. Very high risk, yeah. Disclaimer there. Yeah. Uh, and non-DOM we touched on as well. Uh, I don't think we really need to go into that any further. If anybody has any further questions on non-DOM status, they can reach out. Um, just wanted to go over the um, so a couple of client cases. I think a few people on the call, this will be quite relevant to them. So if I just go through these uh, scenarios with you, Mike, and you could maybe work through some of these. So uh, Jane works for Unilever. She's debating whether to get a company hybrid car instead of a normal petrol car. Is there a company car tax difference she can benefit from if she chooses the hybrid or, again, a full electric car? Yeah, great question and something that um, probably should have been touched on when we were speaking about employees, because this is something that, that can make a massive difference. So if you're an employee you or you run your own company, you can have the ability to have an, a company car. Um, if you're an employee, your employer needs to offer this. OK, it's not available to all because some employers simply aren't big enough or aren't uh, geared up to, to offer this to their staff. But if they do, then um, essentially the, the, the company will uh, provide you with a car which you can then use in business, but also personally. And the government, um, as they always will do, inspires our decision making by giving us good tax breaks in areas that they want investment. And hybrid or electric, um, you get some really good tax breaks on and, you know, the the clues in the name that it's to inspire electric car development. Um, so by giving people tax breaks on electric cars or hybrids, the car manufacturers will want to build better electric cars and hybrids and therefore will invest more in their development of them. Um, so big brothers watching you, they are um, maybe inadvertently inspiring our decision making. But if you look at the example on screen, um, you will see that a BMW, I think these are two very, very similar BMWs, both X5s. One is few, uh, petrol or diesel, and on the right is a hybrid. Um, with a hybrid, so long as CO2 emissions are under 50, it probably will be. Um, you then look at the full electric range of the car, but this particular car uh, is... It does over, over 50 miles, so it comes in at 8%. Thank you. Uh, Eight percent benefit in kind. So you look at the list price, which is a specific figure, the P11D value. Get that from the dealer. Uh, it's about 70, 80 K in this example. Percentage is eight percent, which means multiply one by the other to get your benefit in kind. That goes on your tax return and you pay tax on that. And the headline I'm struggling to see, but I'm, I'm getting right in there. The headline is um, 
hybrid will cost a 40% taxpayer three grand a year in tax, whereas if it was non-hybrid, it would be 11 grand a year in tax. So it's definitely worthwhile thinking about hybrid and or electric. Electric percentages are 3% at the moment, so they're even better than hybrid, but you've got to gear yourself up to drive an electric car, charge a car, et cetera, et cetera. It's a bit difficult for some people. And for those that uh, claim their fuel allowances, I think we had a conversation about this recently. Uh, you said you can claim up to 10,000 miles at four and a half PM mile, is it? No. So it, de it, de it depends on your circumstances. If you've got a company car, then your uh your the, hmm, okay if your company pays for all fuel that's business fuel and uh personal fuel that's when you get this fuel benefit in kind okay that's what you can see on the screen which is about twenty eight thousand pounds um that then gets added to your personal tax return and can be very expensive so broadly it's not always right, but broadly, the advice is um, if you have a company car, you still pay for your personal fuel yourself because the fuel benefit in kind is quite expensive. Now, if you have a company car and you pay for the business miles yourself, business fuel yourself, you can then reclaim um, 10 PMR might have just gone up for the fuel. Uh, element of that car if you have an and this is the 45p Hamza was referring to if you have a car that is not a company car so your own personal car that you use for business you can then claim 45p a mile from your from your company uh, your employer um, to reimburse you not only for the fuel but for the depreciation and the MOT and the tyres it's just an estimated amount that HMRC allow. Fantastic. Oh, we've got a question in. If your company director is an electric company car but needs to do some long distance drives, can you use your partner's petrol car and claim mileage at 45p for this mile? Yeah, 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 you can. Yeah, I've got no issue with that. If you're going on a business trip and you use a non company car, then you can claim that, that 45p. Right. Limited company, new, new case this one. Uh, limited company versus sole trader. Joel is a consultant earning £100,000 a year profit with high living costs. Would changing from a limited company structure into a sole trade lead to any tax savings? Yeah, so again, to touch on a question which I didn't answer because I knew the slide was coming. Um, if you're earning 100K and you need access to all of that money for living costs, childcare, mortgage, holidays, uh, food and drink, etc., then actually, and I've done the maths earlier, um, on 100k needing access to all of the money you will be losing out by 2842 pounds a year i.e you will save 2800 quid a year in tax as a sole trader that's the impact of the increased corporation tax and the impact of decreased national insurance for workers um now as i touched on there's still some instances where a limited company will be preferred. So if you have a lower earning spouse that you can involve in your business, then a limited company may be uh, still a viable option. Alternatively, if we look at, uh, let's look at an accountancy firm. Um, let's look at a very small one man band uh, accountancy firm that knows in five years he wants to buy his buddies um, uh, clients off him for 200 grand and therefore he needs to save money in his limited company in order to buy a business asset then doing that via a limited company is, is still the right way also um, electric cars hybrid cars you don't get the same um, reliefs allowances as a sole trader as you do with limited companies so if you were looking at a hybrid or electric car to fund your personal and business travel then limited companies may still be preferred Salaries versus dividends versus pensions. What yeah, so the, the, the marginal tax rate is 26.5% for companies earning uh, over 50 grand. Now it's it's gone into, a, it used to be 19%. It's now gone into a bit more complex um, corporation tax regime, which with a simple 
company where the owners only own one company um, says if your profits are under 50k you pay 19 percent tax if your profits are over 250 250k you pay 25 percent tax and if they're between you pay um a, a proportion between 19 and 25 percent when you get to this it's hard to explain when you get to the 250 you don't get you get nothing at 19 percent so it's not like you get the first 50 at 19 percent and then the next at a percentage and then everything above that at 25 percent it's everything over 250 is at 25 percent when you do the maths that actually means your marginal percentage is 25 26.5 uh, percent so if you're a simple company profit of 100k but you making increased pension contributions for your pension the director's pension you your company will save 26.5 percent corporation tax used to be 19 percent you can see now from 19 so you're, you're saving an extra seven and a half percent by making that pension contribution so uh, the topic of conversation is now should we be increasing um pension contributions should we be increasing salaries and should we decrease dividends salaries are still difficult national insurance is the killer for salaries and um, so it's still low salary high dividends for the money you're getting out of the company um, but potentially increasing pension contributions because of that increased tax and benefit in your company cool and associate company rules yeah i could spend hours on this and it's a bit of a minefield um broadly if you are a, let's say you're an entrepreneur and you own multiple companies um, then you have multiple associated companies and that um 25 corporation tax bracket i mentioned will will uh, essentially that 250k will come down with the more associated companies you have quick example uh one client of mine he, he owns about 10 companies um all doing bits and pieces some not doing so much um so we're actually looking at closing five or six of them um by just moving some assets around and consolidating uh, some of the the interest into into one company by doing that would probably save him a couple of grand a year in in tax yeah, we've got an exercise on our hands to to get him from A to B, um, but we reckon that our fees in order to do that will be outweighed by tax savings in one, two, three years, something like that. So um, something to consider. Great. Expats, just a quick one on this as well. Tom has been living and working in Dubai for the past five years. His children are getting older and he'd like for them to get educated in the UK. That means free education in the UK. He is looking to move back home, wants to plan ahead to avoid any tax problems upon arrival. What does he need to be aware of from a tax perspective when returning to the UK? And does the time of year, this is one that gets asked a lot, the time of year for his move matter? Arriving back to the UK in the middle of the tax year as an example. Yeah, um, so this is statutory residency test, which looks at um, two, two main things, days in the UK, ties to the UK. The more ties you have in the UK, the lower the amount of days you're allowed in the UK before you become a UK tax resident. If you're a UK tax resident, you're taxed on your worldwide income in the UK, um, unless you're a non-DOM, which we talked about earlier, which means you may be able to claim the remittance basis charge, but let's not go into that again. Um, so. Tom needs to be aware that he, he could be subject to worldwide, uh, to UK tax on his worldwide income in the year he returns. So if he has the ability to wait until March to then move back in April, that's going to be a clean cutoff for him because everything up to March is in an old tax year, new tax year starts April, he can come in. Obviously, timings don't work perfectly in, in the real world. So um, you then look at whether you can claim this thing called split year rules, which says up to this date, I'm going to be taxed in the UAE. And after this date, I'm going to be taxed in the UK. It's not a given. Some people can really mess it up. Um, normally, it looks at it like if you cease to have a home in the UK and uh, sorry, you cease to have a home abroad and have a home in the UK. That's one consideration. Some people 
don't sell their home in UAE or don't have a home in UAE and therefore they don't meet that rule um, and other um, uh, yeah and other considerations is that they maybe start working full-time in the UK or sometimes people from the UAE come back or out of their jurisdictions come back and, and don't work for a period of time and therefore they also meet uh, don't meet that rule and then all of a sudden the X amount of money in the UAE in the tax year becomes subject to UK tax. So, so it just needs a bit of planning, a bit of thought. Yeah. And also on investments, if somebody had held a number of investments in the UAE, for example, where they wouldn't pay capital gains tax on, on the growth of them prior to returning to the UK, best to take that profit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're not in the UK for five years and you sell assets, whether they're UK assets or not, ex with the exception of UK resident, uh, sorry, the exception of UK property. Yeah. Then they're not subject to uh, UK tax. So, yeah, if you've got some investments whilst you're in a, a tax haven, it may well be sensible to crystallise those investments whilst you're in the tax haven, because otherwise they could well be subject to UK tax. Lovely. And Joanne is a British expat in the US. She should she contribute to a UK pension while she's overseas? Should she be making direct contributions if she's a business owner and can she contribute to her previous UK pensions? Uh, yeah, I looked into this one, not overly comfortable. So uh, if this is relevant to anyone, make sure you take advice specific to your circumstances. Assuming Joanne's business is a UK company and she is doing work for that UK company, her UK company should be able to make pension contributions to her pension, be that a UK pension, US pension or, or whatever pension, and get UK tax relief on that contribution. Should she make per, uh, professional employee personal contributions, then she uh, is limited to UK relevant earnings. So if she is living in the US and her income is paid to her in the US, then uh, she probably doesn't have any UK relevant earnings. So she can contribute a maximum of £3,600 for five years. For, for five years. Thank you, Hamza. Um, and then um, after that, she can continue contributing, I believe, but she can't get tax relief on it. And most pension providers don't accept pension contributions where you don't get tax relief on it. No, you're right. Good. Excellent. I think this is the last one relevant to quite a few of our clients. Um, Sam owns a large shareholding in a veterinary hospital. He'll be moving to Dubai for five to seven years or will sell shareholding whilst in Dubai? Yeah, uh, we touched on it. If you're out of the UK for five years, um, then your shares in UK companies become outside the scope of UK tax. So uh, it's a five year plan. I have a client um, thinking of doing this. Uh, his kids are now going to university. They're, they're fly uh, leaving the nest and um, uh, yeah, he's quite happy to go travelling for a bit and then set himself up with his brother who lives in UAE, UAE and at the same time will think of selling his uh, shares in a UK trading company. Um, if he was in the UK, would be subject in this case to, to CGT at 20% for him, uh, maybe 10% if it's if, if you have a, a large ownership in that company um, and you can claim entrepreneur's relief. Uh, I don't know what the tax rate is in Dubai, but I assume it's still zero percent and therefore you won't be paying anything in Dubai when you sell those shares. Correct. It is still zero. Although there's been talk of bringing the taxes in. Thank you very much, Mike. Have you got any uh, questions in the chat that you haven't answered? I'm just going back and I think there was some. Uh, did I back at child benefit uh, broadly at what? Threshold would it be better to be sold trade in a limited company. There is no threshold. Can't answer that. You need to look at your specific circumstances. It depends on profits. It depends on your need for cash. It depends on your investment plans, business investment plans, and it depends on your family situation. Um, hybrid R E I S investments part of associated companies. Associated companies are only um, uh, look at companies under common control. So if you own uh, or control a company, then they could well be associated. Um, and there's also these interdependence rules that if, I don't know, if I owned a accountancy company, 
and my wife owned a property company. There's an argument to say they're not linked. But if I lent money from my accountancy company to my wife's property company to allow her to go or her company to go and buy property, there's then a financial interdependence, which would mean they're associated, would probably mean they're associated. So you, you just got to be careful there. Grey areas. Excellent. Mike, you're an expert in grey areas and very, mm -hmm. very thorough as always. I don't think there's any other questions or queries. If anybody does want to reach out to Mike, we can send you his details. Like I said, I cannot recommend him highly enough. He's worked with me for in excess of 10 years. He's slightly changed in appearance in 10 years, as you can probably see. Um, but his knowledge just gets better and better. And he's a he's an absolute wealth of advice. So thanks very much for uh, for helping us out with this, Mike. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, guys.